join me in Genesis chapter 13. Once again, happy Super Bowl Sunday. Yes, I'm aware the Panthers are not in the Super Bowl. All right. Uh, how many of you, how many of you are pulling for the Kansas City Swifties? I mean, the, uh, what are they? Whoa, I thought they're going to be offended. They were not offended. Did you hear that? How many of you are rooting for the San Fran uh, 49ers? Okay, okay. How many of you are like, Pastor Scott, I don't give a rip. <laughs> I just want to eat some buffalo wings today. You're more excited about the puppy bowl, aren't you? Yeah, God's got a, that's a thing. You guys know about the Puppy Bowl? I just heard about this. The quarterbacks, as I understand it, in the Puppy Bowl are Patrick Mabones and Bark Purdy. That's, that's, that's true. That's true. Uh, Carolina is not in the Puppy Bowl. Not that they could win it. Okay. Let's dive into Genesis 13. We read a lot of our text today. We read it last week. But we're going to go back in. We're going to tear this up. Abram and Lot are the principal figures here. They have come up from Egypt. They had gone down to Egypt in a time of famine, out of Canaan. Abram had an embarrassing moment down there, and God taught him a lesson, and now they have reemerged into the promised land, and they have experienced some strife between them. They both have some livestock, and there's not enough pasture, not enough grass to sustain both of their livestock wherever they are. And so there is division, there is strife brewing, and Abram doesn't want this to be a problem, and so he offers a solution. So look with me at verse 8. We're going to read now from 8 to 18. It says, Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. It is not the whole land before you separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, I will go to the right, and if you take the right, I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other, and Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked great sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look to the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. And I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can also be counted. Arise, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent, came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. Back in the first century, there was a Roman city called Pompeii. Pompeii lie in the shadow of Mount Vesuvius, which happened to be a volcano. And when Mount Vesuvius erupted, the city of Pompeii was devastated. Now you can visit the ruins of Pompeii today and you can see the citizens of Pompeii. In fact, you can see them exactly as they were at the moment Vesuvius blew its top, because at that moment they were encased, many of them, in ash. And so they stand there today as human statues. And one of the most interesting human statues is of a young lady. And this young lady perished in the streets of Pompeii and cemented in her hands were the most precious, most valuable things to her. Now, maybe you've wondered, if my home was on fire, burning to the ground, what would I take as I left that house? The most important thing that you might grab, what would it be? Is it a, is it a photo? Is it, is it a, a family album, uh, an heirloom of some sort? Well, for this young lady, she tarried to collect the most valuable things that she possessed, her jewelry. And the weight of this jewelry may well have been what kept her from making it to the docks where the boats waited to deliver her from certain death. And she didn't make it. And she died, frozen in time, as it were, clutching her precious jewelry that she would never get to enjoy. And one of the great lessons that we can learn is in the importance of making a decision. She made a decision and she paid for it with her life. 
And the decisions that we make often have long-lasting, sometimes permanent ramifications. Our decisions, they don't always dissipate at the end of the day. It's not like we're in the movie Groundhog Day where we do whatever we want. At the end of the day, we just the clock starts all over. We've got two guys in our text today, Abram and Lot, and they're going to make decisions. And the decisions that they make will determine their path, not only theirs, but for their family as well. And these two guys, Abram and Lot, we see them come together. We saw it in chapter 12. They unite. In chapter 13, they're going to separate, and we will never see them reunite in any meaningful way again. And the issue that caused division, that forced them apart, we learn what that issue is. Earlier in chapter 13, we read it last week, in verse 2, there is a word, and it's the first time you see this word in the entire Bible. It's the word rich, the word wealthy. It says, and Abram was rich in livestock. And it's very interesting to me, the first time you see this concept of being rich or wealthy, there's division. It drives people apart. And it's not a matter of one guy's wealthy and the other guy's not. This isn't a haves and have not situation. Both of these guys are wealthy. They both have great wealth. But in the case of the first man, he owns his wealth. In the case of the second man, his wealth owns him. In the case of the first man, his wealth is uh, a blessing from God on a fruitful life. In the case of the second man, his wealth is his primary objective and reason for living. And so today, we're going to discover that at some point, we all have to make the same decision that these guys made, and not just about wealth, but about something else. What is this decision? Look at the difference between these two. Uh, Revisit verse 10 with me. It says, and Lot lifted up his eyes. Now drop down to verse 14. It says, The Lord said to Abram, lift up your eyes. I think those verses are very significant. I don't want us to miss this. What is this talking about, lift up your eyes? In your notes, where you fix your eyes reveals your values. Your values. Lot trains his eyes on that which he desires. Abram's eyes are guided to that which the Lord desires. And that is a vital point to make, uh, to make clear on. If I, know, if I know what your values are, I can tell you what your goals in life will be. If I know your values, I know what your priorities are, I know what your ambitions are, I can predict where you're going to spend your money, your time, your, your mental preoccupation, your energy, I can reasonably discern the decisions that you're going to make, I can pretty closely predict where you're going to end up in life if I know your values. Now watch this man Lot. He's going to be led by his immediate passions. Uh, he looks at that which represents what, what will come to him right now. Right now. Abram, by contrast, is going to be led by an eternal promise. And with regard to Lot, if you were to go from this chapter, chapter 13, all the way to chapter 19, you're going to see where he ends up. His life is, is it going to end in a wreckage. It's going to be a total mess because his claim to fame is not chapter 13, it's chapter 19. That's what we know about Lot. That's what he's known for, for going spiritually bankrupt. And that happens by Genesis 19. But understand something. The seed that is planted that grows into spiritual bankruptcy and the life of Lot, it doesn't happen in chapter 19. It happens in chapter 13. If you read chapter 19, there really is no lesson to be learned about Lot without chapter 13. And it's ironic that chapter 13 is what people who are in dire financial straits file for bankruptcy. And he goes spiritually bankrupt, and it begins right here. And there's a decision that he makes. Now, how how much time passes between chapter 13 and chapter 19? It's about 25 years, and that tells us something, that that the decisions that we make often ferment over time. That's what decisions do. Eventually, something will grow out of your decision. It's going to spend time fermenting. Is it going to to ferment and become a fine wine? Or is it going to become something moldy and poisonous? I want you to stay in chapter 13, keep your place, and then I want you to join me in 2 Peter chapter 2. We're going to learn what kind of man Lot is. What kind of a man is Lot? There are only two times in the New Testament that we see Lot mentioned. Jesus mentions him in the Gospels. 
Uh, as an example of worldliness, talks about the, the wife of Lot, who turns back to the old ways. We're going to learn about her in the weeks to come. The other time is right here in 2 Peter 2. And it talks about the mercy of God on sinful believers. Now, what kind of man is he? In your notes, Lot is righteous. He's a righteous man. That might surprise you. If you asked Lot how he would access eternity, he would not say, it's because I'm a good man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have uh, eternity with the Lord. He's, he would never say that. He is considered a righteous man because he understands it's, it's faith in the promise of God. He believed, along with his uncle Abram, uh, that he was by nature a sinner and that he must trust in the sovereignty of God. Here's what 2 Peter 2, 7 says. It says, and if he, that would be God, rescued righteous Lot. Righteous Lot. Lot and Abram are of the same faith. Abram is not dragging around some pagan, uh, ungodly person. We don't see a lot of theological error in Lot. He is orthodox. He and Abram will end up on opposite ends of the spectrum. Throughout history, you have a lot of people that name their children after Abraham. You don't have anybody that names their kids after Lot. You do not. Um, He believes right, but he ends up losing his own wife, his own son. His own daughters fall into perversion. Uh, Lot, his final act that we read about is going to be one of drunkenness and incest. And yet, according to Peter, he's Righteous, because Lot will end up in this city called Sodom. And God will judge this wicked city, Sodom, but he will tell Abram that he will spare the righteous. And so we're going to read about that. And we're going to understand something, that God will spare the righteous from his judgment. Never in Scripture do we see the righteous fall under the judgment of God. Do they go through trials in the world? Yes. Do they go through persecution by the world? Yes. Do they go through the judgment and wrath of a holy God? The righteous never do. You don't see that. It's never a thing in the Bible. For that reason, I believe that he will take his church out of the world before he judges it via that seven-year tribulation. I fully believe that. But this says that he rescued righteous Lot... Greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. It says righteous three times in this text. That tells you that Lot is righteous. It comes from a place called Padan Aram up in Mesopotamia. After God called Abram, there developed in that region a pocket of monotheistic people. Lot was from there. Uh, when Abram is at the end of his life as Abraham, he's got a son. He's going to seek a wife for his son. He's going to send his servant back up to that same spot. How come? Because there are no monotheists in Canaan. You've got to go back to Padan Aram and find a wife, and that's where he finds Rebekah. Rebekah marries Isaac, and when they are old, she's going to tell her son Jacob, you go back up to where I came from, where your daddy found me. That's where you're going to find a woman like me. That's what every woman wants is for their boy to marry a woman like her. And so that's where he's from. We're not talking about an an unregenerate pagan man here. I'm going to throw something at you, some observations that I've made, and we'll see if you can tell what the next principle here is. When Abram comes from Ur of the Chaldees and he goes over to Haran, I'm doing it backward for you, right? He goes over to Haran. He, He brings Lot with him. Lot's his nephew. When Abram leaves Haran and he goes down into Canaan, Lot comes with him, okay? When there's famine in Canaan and Abram goes down into Egypt to get food, Lot comes with him. After the famine is over, he comes back up to Canaan, Lot comes with him. Lot is with his uncle Abram the entire time. And so he is there, and when they finally re-enter the land, here's what you see. You see Abram building an altar to the Lord, calling upon the name of the Lord. But you don't see Lot building an altar to the Lord. He does not call upon the Lord. And so what that tells us is that Lot may be righteous, but in your notes, Lot is not a disciple. He has not grown. He has not been weaned spiritually. There's a righteousness. There's a faith that justifies. He's orthodox in his beliefs. He knows all the right things, but he lives his life by proxy. He is subsisting on the faith of his uncle Abram. 
He does not personally relate to God. He believes, he trusts in the God that Abram personally relates to. He's never caught up in the same eternal passion with which God has gripped Abram. So Lot's just getting by spiritually. Everything in his life is in a neat little box. You open that box, everything is in its proper compartment. He's got his insurance policy here. He's got his financial records here. He's got his faith here. It's all very structured. It's all good. I've trusted in Yahweh. He thinks I'm good. But his life is lived as though God does not exist. I've heard it said that God has no grandchildren. God only has children. You're not his because your mama or daddy was a believer or your granddaddy or your uncle or your aunt. Yahweh is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God never relates to Isaac through Abraham. He breaks Isaac. He draws him to him. He changes him. God never relates to Jacob through Isaac. Jacob is broken and changed by the Lord. Does this happen today where people live by proxy? Are there people in the church that are like, this is where they've grown up and they, they know enough to be saved, but they're not living abundant life the way they're intended to? Do people live by proxy? I could tell you this was me for a long time. My father was a pastor. My mom and dad were solid believers. I grew up in church. I knew all the songs. I could recite the verses. We sat around a dinner table every night, held hands, said grace. I could win any Bible drill blindfolded. I knew where to find Habakkuk, okay? <laughs> but I was living by proxy for the most part. And there was a day that had to come when I was in college and I'm out from under mom and dad and I had to make my faith my own. And that day comes for all of us. And there was a day that came for Lot. But what happened? Look at verse 11. It says, so Lot chose for himself. He chose for himself. You gotta choose. The day will come when you have to choose. But there was a process that was there for me, that was probably there for you, but it was a process that Lot did not go through. It's a process that prepares us for this choice. There's a weaning. There's a, a struggle that we have to go through. Uh, you ever watch those nature documentaries or nature programs? It used to be you'd flip channels and they'd be on there, you know. And you'd hear David Attenborough talking about something. You'd just be transfixed, you know, and now you've got to be looking for him in the age of streaming. But I remember watching one and there was a butterfly. The butterfly is struggling to get out of this cocoon, you know. And here's the cameraman just filming this whole thing. How do they sit there and capture all this stuff? It's like months they're just there waiting for this chrysalis to develop, you know, with this butterfly is coming out of it, struggling. And the narrator is doing a little voiceover. He's, he's describing what's happening. And as this butterfly is struggling, a fluid is released all over the wings of that butterfly. And the narrator says, if you were to pry that cocoon apart and help that butterfly out, in the long run, you would end up killing him. Because that fluid is helping to prepare that butterfly for flight. And if you bypass that struggle, he's not prepped for flight. He will never take flight. He will fall to the ground. And you could look at him and it's this fully formed, beautiful butterfly. But he won't do what a butterfly does. And eventually something will come along and devour him. And that's what's going to happen to Lot. He has not been developed. He's lived by proxy. He's on spiritual life support. He's never gotten close to God. You gotta struggle. You gotta struggle with the deeper things of God. It will prepare you to make the right decision of commitment. Abraham's gonna watch his own son struggle. Isaac is gonna have a dispute, a land dispute with a Canaanite. He's gotta go through it. God's gonna use that in his life. Isaac's own son, Jacob, he's gonna struggle. He's going to swindle his brother out of his birthright and in fear flee for his life and, and all alone journey up on the Judean arch toward Mesopotamia and he's going to replay his mistakes and he's going to have bad fortune in every uh, business venture he enters into but God's going to use that to make a man, to make a believer. We have to go through that. We have to understand life is hard. We are weak. God is strong. And because God is strong, we can become strong. 
Lot was spiritually immune deficient. Your immunity goes down if you don't struggle. What happens if your immunity goes down and you don't struggle? The first spiritual germ that comes along attaches to you, takes you out. There's no spiritual immunity with Lot. And here's the sequence of how that went down. Here's the sequence of Lot's downfall. Verse 10 We reread, and Lot lifted up his eyes. What does this mean? In your notes, he sets his gaze upon the world. He sets his gaze upon unrighteousness. This is where it begins. He looks upon that which holds his interest. Abram has just told him, which do you want? You go to the right, you go to the left. What should Lot have done? What should have been his response? The noble thing, the righteous thing, would have been to say, you know what, Uncle Abraham, uh, you know, you, you brought me here. You're the one that God came to with the covenant. I'm at your service. I'll, whichever you want, I'll take the leftovers. That would have been the noble thing, and yet he doesn't say that. Instead, he lifts up his eyes. In verse 11, so Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east, and thus they separated from each other. So he goes east. Why does he do this? There's something out there that has grabbed his attention because deep inside Lot, there is a spore of materialism. It's always been there. It was up in Haran, deep within him, when he was under his father, his grandfather. Now he's been under, under Uncle Abraham, and it still consists in him. And so now he's out of the nest. He's got to choose for himself, and he goes with his passions. He goes with his inner desires, and his eyes are drawn toward what the world offers. And this is a good lesson for all of us, especially those of us who are young people. We need to learn this lesson here. Verse 12, Abram settled in the land of Canaan while Lot settled among the cities of the valley. And then watch what happens. He moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. So what happens here? First, Lot sets his gaze upon the world. And then in your notes, now he draws near. To the world. He's moving in the direction of the world. Why is he drawn toward Sodom? Verse 13 just made it clear there's wickedness in Sodom. Did Lot know about this? Of course he did. Lot's not making this decision in ignorance. The whole reason they're in Canaan is to be ungodly, excuse me, is to be godly people in a land of ungodly people. So he knows that they exist. Every person that lives in Canaan is ungodly. And yet, he chooses, and he chooses the Jordan Valley. Now, it's one thing to be in the Jordan Valley. It's another thing to move near, near Sodom. There's enough pasture for his cattle. To go near Sodom doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Why is he making his home there? Why would God's people look toward the godless? In every generation after Shem, there was a father-son convo that went along the lines of, son, we're not like the world. We are not like the world. We are to be godly. We, are, we follow a different path. God's going to bless all the nations of the earth through us. This conversation was had, I am sure, with Lot by Abram. Don't go out there. Don't become part of that. And I'm sure Lot had it all justified in his mind. Oh, Uncle Abe. <laughs> you don't understand. I, 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 I'm going to go witness to them, Uncle Abe. I'm going to start a Bible study out there. I'm going to pass out some brochures on Yahweh. You think that was what he had in mind? No, I don't think so. It's one thing to have the mind of a missionary when you go into a place. That is a godly thing. That's not what Lot is doing. He wants to glean from Sodom. They have something to offer him. And so he might go and live near them when he starts, but what happens? He ends up being, in your notes, immersed in the world. He's immersed because by chapter 14, he's living in the heart of the city. He moves in right downtown. In the next chapter or in the next passage, a bunch of kings are going to come to Sodom and they're going to lay waste and they're going to take hostage a lot of the residents. They take Lot. Why do they take Lot? Because he's living there. He's living there. I'm sure Abram asked him, why are you living in Sodom? And he, he probably rationalized it. You know, it, it just made sense. You know, I, I had to come. It was a fur piece to come to town for supplies. I might as well just live here. It's convenient. It's good stewardship, Uncle Abe. 
And I, by the way, Uncle Abe, it's okay for me to be here. I can live among these and not be affected. Your teenagers give you that same argument. And by chapter 19, God has targeted Sodom for destruction because of their wickedness. And he tells Abram he's going to destroy the city, but he'll spare the city as long as there are righteous people in there. And so God sends two angels to go destroy Sodom and rescue the righteous. And it says in chapter 19, when they get there, they see Lot in the gate of the city. What's he doing in the gate of the city? In the ancient Near East, the gate of the city is where the decisions were made. What does that tell you about Lot? He didn't just move near Sodom. He didn't just move to live in Sodom. He ran for city council. He put down roots. He became one of them. In your notes, he becomes like the world. The angels see him in the gate of the city. They say, this fellow came to sojourn and he's become the judge. He's one of them. Folks, has the church become like the world today? We have. We have identified. Christians can act like the world. Born-again Christians can act like the world. Why? Because we still have a flesh, we still have an old nature. You got a new nature, but if you listen to your old nature more than your new nature, you, you, you avail yourself to be enticed by the world. And the world places a spell on Lot. How come it didn't have a spell on Abram? I'll tell you why. Because Abram had, had encountered God. And he had found the allure of God to be so much greater than the allure of Sodom. The pull of God was stronger because because God was bigger to Abram than Sodom. Sodom was bigger to Lot in this phase of his life than God. You know what? I can't jump very high. I'm a five foot five white guy, all right? Now, on the moon, I could jump six times as high. Why? Because the moon is a lot smaller than the earth. And scientists will tell you that the the larger the planet, the more massive the planet, the wider the diameter of the planet, the stronger the gravitational pull. So if it's bigger, it's got more gravity. God was bigger to Abram than Sodom, and so the pull of God made it so that Sodom had no allure for Abram. How big is your God? Is God large in your sight? Have you encountered and tasted and seen that his purpose for your life is so much grander and greater and more majestic than anything this world has to offer? We need to come to grips with that. But there are some of us to whom God has said, lift up your eyes, as he did to Abram, lift up your eyes, look at what I am calling you to, and yet we divert our gaze and we look toward Sodom. Jesus talks about values in the Sermon on the Mount, and incidentally, in, uh, in the summertime, I'm gonna be teaching on Sunday morning on the Sermon on the Mount. We're gonna break up our Genesis study with some, with some Jesus. Well, there's always Jesus. Jesus. But here's what he says in Matthew 6, 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But, look, uh, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You've heard that line before. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What's that mean? That means get your treasure straight. And when you get your treasure straight, that will determine your heart. That will determine your heart. In other words, wherever your value is, your priorities, your ambitions, your goals will all follow. We got to get our values right. Most of us know money won't make you happy. We know that. We agree with that. And yet sometimes we pray, but maybe this time it will. Lord, maybe this time it will make me happy. I want you to see what the Lord says here in in this same passage. Drop down to verse 24 of Matthew 6. He says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. 
This is not a both and situation right here, but those two passages sandwich in between them. There is an illustration that he gives. Check this out in verse 22, Matthew 6. Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. The eye is the lamp of the body. What do you think that means? He says, the eye is the lamp. What is a lamp used for? You use a lamp to guide your way. It lights your path. You walk where your lamp lights the way. He says, your lamp is your eye. What you set your gaze upon determines your path. So he says, if your eye is healthy, some versions say clear. Basically, we mean uncorrupted, unpolluted by worldliness. If it is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad... Your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great the darkness. What that means is it's the worst thing in the world for your lamp to go dark. This is your lamp. This is your lamp. Your value system, if it becomes corrupted, it's going to set a a dark trajectory for your life. You're going to take the wrong path. Now, if all the lights in this room were to go out, and it went totally black in here, eventually we'd be okay because what happens when you walk into a dark room? Your eyes adjust, okay? You you find whatever light source there is. That's what your eyes do. Uh, Your pupils get bigger to take in more light. But he says, but if your eye is bad, if your eye is bad, what happens? If you have a cataract, if, if your optic nerve detaches You won't find a light source. And you're just going to continue to function in the dark. That's what happened a lot. He went for success. His value system got wrecked. Now go back to 2 Peter with me. 2 Peter chapter 2. We're going to reread this and emphasize a different point here. Lot doesn't show up where Abraham shows up in the New Testament. Abraham makes an appearance in Hebrews 11. That's the chapter where God highlights the faithful. Lot shows up in 2 Peter 2. This is the chapter where it talks about the mercy of God on carnal people. That's not the chapter you want to be in. But here's what it says, 2 Peter 2, 7. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed. I want you to underline the word distressed. Distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. That word distressed. Some versions say oppressed. It's the Greek word katapaneo, and it means to beat down to the dirt, to just wear down, to grind down. Lot was worn down by a pagan worldly system. He placed himself in that wicked city, and it wore him down. Verse 8, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting, underline tormenting. He was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Who was tormenting Lot's soul? Was it Sodom? Was it the devil? No, he was tormenting. He was tormenting his righteous soul. What happens to the righteous man that pursues unrighteousness? The word for tormenting here is the Greek root uh, basanizo. It's used in reference to the torture of hell. What happens when the righteous pursue unrighteousness? Peter says it's hell on earth. You are subjecting yourself to the torture of hell needlessly. And Lot makes a decision that begins that torture. Sets him on a course. It has long-lasting ramifications. And he just makes a decision. And it's a thoughtless decision. He doesn't think it through. One of the great prime ministers in the history of Great Britain was a man named uh, William Gladstone. William Gladstone was a devout Christian. And there's a story that a young man approached Prime Minister Gladstone. He says, Sir William, I, uh, I would like very much to seek your counsel on life. And Gladstone said, Ah, yes, of course, young man. What, uh, tell me, what are your objectives? And the young man replied, he said, Well, I'd like to attend Cambridge. Gladstone said, good, good, that's a good school. Tell me, what will you do then? Young man said, well, I'd like to study law. Gladstone said, ah, very good. We need good men to know and apply the law, practice law. And tell me, what will you do then? 
Young man said, well, I'd like to go into politics. Gladstone said, that's a tough road, lots of responsibility. And what will you do then? Young man said, well, sir, one day I'd, I'd like your job. I'd like to be prime minister of Great Britain. Gladstone said, well, someone's got to do it. It's good that you set your goals high. Tell me, what will you do then? Young man said, well, when I finish and I retire from politics, I'd like to collect my experiences, put them in a journal, and distribute it to young people who come after me so that they could learn from my experiences and avoid my mistakes. Gladstone said, that is very wise. Many do not think beyond their own life, but tell me, what will you do then? Young man said, well, I'm not sure. Said, uh, I, I suppose then, uh, at the end of life, I shall just go the way of all men and die. And Gladstone looked at him and said, and what will you do then? The young man paused for several seconds. Finally, he said, uh, Sir William, I admit that I've been so preoccupied with my education and my plans that I, I haven't had time to really think through uh, what, be, what lies beyond this life. Sir William said, Ah, well, young man, you've asked for my counsel. Here it is. Go to your room, kneel at your bed, and before your God, think through to the end, the very, very end. That is something that Lot did not do when he made his decision. He did not think it through. There are investments that we can make that have eternal value. Lot believed in God in a general sense. He trusted in the promise of that God, but he did not make decisions with the understanding of an eternal investment. That's the lesson of our text. Our text is really not about being wealthy or being non-wealthy. The Bible condemns materialism. It does not condemn material. To say that God condemns materialism is not to say that God admonishes you because of how much you have. God is not down on the size of your house, your acreage, your bank account. He just wants to come first. He wants to come first. There are many wealthy people that God has blessed and they are devout believers because they don't cling to their wealth and they understand from whence that wealth comes and they have a heart that holds loosely to it that says, this is yours, God. I will invest in eternal things. So I don't want you to leave with the wrong impression. Materialism has not to do with your possessions. It has to do with your values. Your values. And your parting thought is that your values determine your decisions. Your decisions determine your life. And God is saying to you, lift your eyes. Where are your eyes today? He says to you as he did to Abram, lift your eyes and choose. Choose wisely. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to choose wisely. Give us your eyes. Give us a will to be guided by you to that which lasts eternally, to believe in the eternal promises of God. To not put all of our hope and our faith in what we possess in the temporal, in the things that are but kindling on this earth, God, help us to think life through to its very, very end. And I ask your blessing upon everyone in this room today. May you bless them beyond measure, God, but may you give them an eternal perspective at the same time. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'm Pastor Scott Grimm, and we want to thank you for joining us as we reach, raise, and release genuine followers of Jesus Christ here at the Lamb's Chapel. Uh, if you want to know when a video drops or when we go live, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And send this video to someone who needs to hear it. And make sure you invite them to join you here with us live this week. We'll see you soon.